I'm Charlie Bright of Gold Derby, and I'm speaking with Oscar-nominated composer and songwriter Jay Ralph, who wrote and performed the song Dustin Ash from the documentary The Voice of Dustin Ash about uh, Iranian uh, singer and maestro Mohammad Reza Sajarian, uh, which has been shortlisted for the Best Original Song Oscar. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, first question I wanted to ask was, were you familiar with, uh, Sajar with Shazarian and his music prior to signing on to this documentary? Absolutely not. Um, you know, I was, uh, uh, it was actually Sting's daughter, Fuchsia Sumner, that turned me on to the project. She's one of the producers. And she said, you know, I got to show you this, this uh, trailer. It's this film. I think you'd be, you know, uh, really great to get on board. And I was just blown away. And, uh, you know, it's this incredible, um, this incredible revelation when you get to experience something of this magnitude and not have ever heard anything about it before this. Uh, Shajarian is one, you know, according to NPR, one of the 50 greatest voices of all time. And, uh, you know, it's just he, his heart and his humility and his talent is just something that is you very, very rarely get to see. It's uh, he's extraordinary, extraordinary human being. He was a story, you know, he's, he's not uh, with us any longer, but uh, he, he was an incredible person. Um, so uh, what were the most fascinating elements in hearing both uh, Shajar, Shajarian's uh, music for the first time and the Persian classical music as well as a whole that he had been a part of? I an, an instantly felt that this was music that was bigger than us as a species. You know, it, it was almost transcendent and it was connected to you know other realms of just uh you know the universe so to speak this guy sings you know um we don't really have a a, a correlation in the west because you know there's big artists uh whether it's you know uh dylan or uh the beatles that get anointed as uh you know uh, that their lyrics are like sermons and they have this deity-like quality, but Shajarian's music, uh, his voice is used as the Rabana prayer at the break of Ramadan. So, um, you know, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's something in the West where it would almost be like if you combine the Beatles and the Pope, because it's such a, it has such religious significance, his voice and such, connection to belief uh, that it was just extraordinary to see and then juxtaposed with the humility and the generosity of spirit and how he stood for the people uh, to always, you know, make sure that his his goals were aligned with protecting uh, the history of Iran and the history uh, of of the language there and and the rights uh, and wishes of the people. So very unique person, and you know, uh, as I'm sure we can discuss here. But he he you know traded his very very illustrious privileged career to stand up and stick with the people, and especially because to this day women are not allowed to perform uh, solo uh, in public or on records. He he would make. Uh, a point to have his daughter uh, play solo on stage as this, uh, you know, uh, proclamation of of equality and 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 talent, and that's why his daughter uh, sings the finale of the song. Um, uh, and what about um, what was it like getting to explore? Did you get to get a, did you get a chance to explore um, uh, the the genre of Persian classical music uh, as well beyond? Uh, uh, Shajar, Shajarian's music? Yeah, I mean, he he, he is like, uh, you know, the, the definition of Persian classical music. So, I mean, it all roads uh, seemingly lead to him. But yes, Mandana, the director, uh, uh, shared with me so many pieces. And as we discussed, you know, uh, where the narrative was going and how we wanted to distill the son sonic narrative, she, you know, got to... to hear so many pieces you know uh and and a deep dive into this very rich culture
so uh, for when you were composing, when you were starting to compose uh, the song Dust and Ash, um, was getting the right tone uh, for the song a challenge at all for you? Or did, did this type of, or, or did the right tone for the song in terms of the lyrics, specifically with the lyrics, just come very naturally for you? It was a process. I think, you know, we, we were very, very intentional about how and what we wanted this to sound like. You know, we did not need this. Virtually all 80 million people in Iran uh, idolize Shah Jaryan. You know, he, he's a he's a hero and a, and a monumental talent. Uh, we did not need an, another uh, Persian song at the end of the film because everyone in that country knows and celebrates this person, virtually everyone. Um, you know, so we wanted to bring uh, a, a Western voice for a multitude of reasons. We want we wanted something that would speak to the West that people understood and that would be a bridge to this story, but also something to harken back to the fact that um, b before 1979, the revolution, th there was a very uh, the Shiraz Arts Festival was a profoundly um, progressive festival with uh, Arthur Rubinstein coming to play piano, a lot of interesting artists from the West. And uh, it was a very collaborative, uh, uh, you know, uh, culture uh, of love and, 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 and uh, intrigue and, and, and wanting to explore other cultures. So we, we wanted to punctuate that um, at the end of the film and uh, create this, you know, uh, you know, kind of, I guess, uh, uh, you know, statement of solidarity, if you will, and then setting it in a kind of blues folk modality to, that is like what, what would be, I guess, a traditional setting for folk music and protest songs and, you know, things where the voice and the lyrics are in the forefront and the music is really meant to give you uh, a harmonic bed to set it against. But we really want the words to be, you know, prominent and, and at, at the forefront. So was the song always planned as a duet? And uh, what made you want uh, Nora Jones uh, to help provide vocals for the track? Sure, um, great question. Uh, definitely not planned as a duet. Um, basically, the reason I thought Nora would be perfect is because we're dealing with one of the greatest voices uh, ever in the film. And so it needed to be someone that is recognized as that, you know, uh, you, with their instrument having a transcendent, powerful quality in their voice. So Nora's a friend. We've worked together on various different things. And uh, I, I was really uh, excited to see if she'd be interested. And ultimately, I had sang a guide vocal for the director to kind of show like this is the kind of vibe and, you know, I imagined maybe Nora's take on what that could sound like. When Nora and I got to the studio and she started singing it, she, you know, she's like, this is kind of an odd key for me. It's too low to kind of sing low. And if I sing high, I'm going to be like kind of shouting the whole time, you know, at the top of my register. And I was like, well, let's just see. And we were kind of experimenting. And she's like, this thing that you did in the demo, <clears throat> having this, you know, very low you know, kind of brooding voice. <clears throat> I can't, I can't do that. It's not going to sound like that. I think we should just kind of sing it together. And I'm like, what? Like, you know, cause now we're dealing with Nora and Shajarian as like, you know, this, uh, and especially where it sits in the film, he returns to his song, Morge Sahar, which is this li life affirming song that he, it kind of bookends the entire story and is part of the middle of the story too as this, it's the way Mandana tells the story through this powerful song. And in the film, uh, not to spoil the film, but it's, he sings it for the last time, you know, acapella. So it's this very profound moment where he's singing his most famous song, acapella. We follow that song. And I was like, I have no business singing anything. I mean, I'm good to just sing my little things to get the demos out. Obviously, you know, it's, uh, a vibey cool thing, but it's not what I intended. But it, it certainly uh, evolved into a very interesting, cool, cool, uh, you know, uh, duet, you know. And then with uh, Mojgan, his daughter, 
taking the reins at the end as this coda, you know, uh, you know, just punctuating his message uh, and his life almost as if she's singing his spirit through her voice or something. It's, it's really very powerful. And then with the lyrics presented on screen to give the significance that words do have power, words can change things. <clears throat> lyrics specifically in songs. Uh, and that's, you know, he was very intentional, Shajarian, about how he would use words and the poetry that he would use. So we did think it was important to have this meditative moment at the end as a, as a coda to the whole film, the, the, the power of storytelling, the power of words, and, you know, the things that you say have impact and in, 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 in this whole narrative. So um, it was a very uh, inspired use that Mandana, you know, designed at the end with these vibrational words that are moving. They're almost alive, you know, um, uh, for all the lyrics. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a very unique use of a song in a movie. I, I've not really seen one like that, especially about a musician. So it's super cool. Um, I, I wanted to take a look at, uh, ask you about uh, your career as a whole, because you've kind of become like a sort of go-to person for scoring documentaries. And I'm curious as to what's it been like, you know, you know, getting to that point in your career where you are sort of this go-to person and how is that tied in with your own activism and your own life? I think it's a great question. I think uh, I'm radically inspired by people people that take risks, uh, usually with their lives and with their livelihoods for sure, to tell stories of important people or important events. And, um, you know, it's where I've been drawn. When you're six years old and you watch Indiana Jones and you want to go out in the backyard or, and, and run around and think that you're Indiana Jones, it's because you think that this guy is you know not human he's a superhero almost and then you get older and you realize it's harrison ford and it's you know obviously not a superhero and da, da, da. and then you get to meet these incredible people that are real life superheroes whether it's philippe for the beauty giving a portrait of beauty to new york city walking between the twin towers or louis sohoyas and his team with the cove breaking into the cove to tell the story james foley who gave his life <clears throat> to show you know, the truth of what's going on in the world, um, you know, chasing ice uh, about, uh, you know, the glaciers and James Baylog, uh, you know, um, being out there and trying to devise technology and to, 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 to give a visual representation of climate change. These are radical storytellers using radical methods. Uh, and it's just, um, it's what, it's what, I love to to help amplify and just growing up in a kind of rough childhood, you know, parents splitting up, people not nice, you know, bullies, this thing, feeling, you know, marginalized or sticking up for people or amplifying stories when you know it's the right thing to do. Like that kind of was baked in at an early age, just because I knew early on for myself personally what it felt like to feel like my, you know, ideas didn't matter or something like that. So um, being able to help people tell stories that are critically important to our lives or our culture, you know, if it's if it's a if it's one of these, you know, artists that we're punctuating, whether it's like the Basquiat documentary or finding Vivian Mayer, um, they're just I don't know. It's something that it's always been very, uh, I can't help myself from not t helping because uh, it, it's just magnetic and it just pulls me in. And uh, I also wanted to ask, you know, we are an awards site and uh, you've uh, been nominated for uh, three Oscars uh, for uh, original song. And uh, your first one came in 2012 for uh, uh, your song from uh, Chasing Ice. And I was wondering, what was it like when you found out that you were nominated for that first Oscar and yeah. what has the experience been like for you getting to go to the Oscars? I mean, I, I imagine it must be surreal every it was time. Very, it was very surreal. I mean, that was, I was, you know, a lot younger at that time. And, uh, you know, that was, 
you know, the Oscars were like a, a, a sacred thing in, 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 in my house growing up. And I would watch it with my mom and she would, you know, would tell me all these different actors and who they were and all this stuff. And I would be watching the music and just so enthralled. And then, um, you know, she was, she was like, everything that I am today is, is from her, you know, her, her support and her encouragement. And she, you'll be there one day, you know, and like she would say that, you know? And so the first time it was, you know, you know, tears of joy to, to, to get that and, and see that, especially for a film that was about something so important, you know, as, as, as climate change and stuff like that. And it's been incredible. The first, you know, the first Oscar dinner that, that I went to, what they used to do, they, I think they still do it, but that was the first year I believe that they did do it where they would bring the nominees to a dinner you know, uh, to celebrate the nominees, no plus ones, no wives, no husbands, no nothing, just, just the nominee. And literally we went to Spago and it was John Williams, Quincy Jones, Alan and Marilyn Bergman, Charles Fox, Thomas Newman. I mean, like, I think Carter Burwell was there as a dear friend and mentor, monumental talent. Um, you know, it was just crazy. Like, you know, it was, you're sitting there with like these, giants of culture and music and and everyone's just talking and sharing stories and and just just beyond 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 uh, you know i still have that photo of me and quincy like you know uh at that that i think charlie fox took you know uh just 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 a crazy experience it's never lost on me the lineage and history that's involved in these specific awards because I think the Oscars has a rarity in culture of being, you know, one of the apex uh, 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 award shows to recognize stuff just sheerly because um, there's only five uh, slots and one song nomination and one score. It's not like other music awards show that have numerous different types of music awards. This is just, they combine everything all into one and it's just like you're stuck with everybody and you know, obviously, movies have a big part in our culture. Uh, so yeah, it's it's been a, it's been a monumental ride. I mean, you walk in the first time, and <clears throat> there's Jack Nicholson with the red glasses, and it, you know everybody looks like you're at the wax museum or something. You know, because it's just like holy cow. <clears throat> you know, it's been been crazy journey, and especially since all these movies are, um, you know, uh, these you know, important stories about species or different things like that. Well, uh, J. Ralph, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we wish you all the best over this award season. And to all our viewers, please like this video, subscribe, and don't forget to go to goldderby.com and use the Gold Derby app to make your predictions. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much.